Hello and welcome to the Modern Fairy Sightings Podcast, where we listen to people's fairy encounters. But take heed, we're not talking about winged tinkerbells here. These are real fairies, real encounters that took people like you and I by surprise. Stay a while and hear their stories. My name is Joe Hickey Hall and I'm a folklore researcher. Dear listener, how are you doing? I'm trying very hard to focus on the light right now. I stopped watching the mainstream news in 2020, and although I keep myself informed of what's going on in the world, I balance that with ensuring I'm maintaining well-being. I hope you're finding ways to stay well too. Despite the impotence of most of our governments, people are coming together all over the world to lead the way, which I find very heartening. I want to say to young people in particular, keep the faith. I do believe we are pushing through to better times despite the worst horror and destruction we're currently witnessing. Humanity is woven together with love so much more powerful than fear or hate. We will get through this together and build a new world, which is already happening. And I firmly believe it's our amazing young people who will lead this. I'm going to link to some well-being resources that I use on the show notes here, which are all free. This episode leads on somewhat from our last episode along the Thames. Again, we are in England, this time in Lancashire, northern England, And we hear from musician Sam McLaughlin, who, as a young man aged 17 or 18, experienced an enchantment in a local woodland. He had known this place all his life and was visiting with a friend when he heard what sounded like children's voices coming from the river. That day, in the woodland, they both experienced orbs and a sense of strange shift in reality, commonly known as the Oz Factor, a term coined by Jenny Randalls. You may have previously heard Sam's music in the background of some of my episodes, particularly the Jack Frost episode. Sam's album Environmental Meditation was created by recording a water harp in a river. The instrument was made by Sam and the resulting music is incredibly otherworldly. I find it so interesting, but of course no surprise, that Sam went on to create music with water after this encounter. In this episode, I'm going to be sharing more of his music from an album called Fay Transit, and both of these albums will be linked on the show notes and are available on Bandcamp. I hope you enjoy this episode, and do come and join our community on Patreon if that sounds like the sort of community you'd like to become part of. We hold monthly Zooms, and there are lots of my own meditations and path workings there too. Thank you to all members of the Curious Crew who support this show and you provide such a welcoming and informative space in the private Discord group. So much gratitude to you. Thank you. And big thanks again to our guest, Sam, for sharing his story. What you're about to hear is a shortened version, and on the full-length version on Patreon, he talks about the many out-of-body experiences and sleep paralysis he endured as a young person. He talks about how he has navigated these throughout his life. It's a very moving story and one which resonated with many of us in the group when we heard the early release. We know that there is much more to this world and this is the point of this project. Many of us know it, but not all of us feel able to talk about it for various reasons. I want to let people know that they are not alone with these experiences. You know the truth and beauty that lies deep within you. You know that you came here to love and to ascend to your own personal freedom, being who you truly are and doing what you came here to do. The possibilities are infinite. You can decide in a moment to let go of all that binds you, open to the possibility of transformation and step into that new way of being. Remain curious.
mystical experiences in general is fraught with danger, or it has been, you know, socially. So coming out, uh, uh, as it were, you know, speaking about yeah. it in a, in a more public forum, it's never been something that I've <laughs> considered doing, you know, keep it private. And there's other reasons to keep it private too keeping things magical, keeping them mis mysterious, you know, not wanting to, like I've told that story enough times now that it, that, that it kind of overlays the event, remembering the events. And it's like that for a lot of it, these experiences that I've had. So I, I was very careful not to, it's like, I just want to tell it once, you know, and then, and then, and then and kind of live my life. I don't know where the Fae begins and other spiritual entities, how you differentiate. In my experience, it's always been a very dynamic and changing. The experience that we that I told you about was the one that would closest match the sort of archetypal about the good folk. It happened in a place that has history as well of me and a dear friend who I've not seen in ages. It was dusk and we were walking in the hills. Uh, near Rochdale, where I grew up, Moorland, and we, and we decided to walk down into the nature reserve in some very steep valleys, you know, with beautiful rocks that are carved by the water over centuries. We weren't using the paths, so we were kind of just jumping from fences and stuff, so we were coming into a path that's not very frequently visited. As we came down into the forest, we noticed like a mist in the air and a feeling as well, a feeling that we both we couldn't ignore, you know, it was, just, it was like so, something had changed in the, in the atmosphere. So we walked into the mist and we both started behaving a bit strangely, like children. That was the thing that I, that I remember. We had like a sense of playfulness that just suddenly came over us and this weird mist and it, it looked, it really felt like, and looked like something out of a hammer horror movie or something like that, or, or you know, like a fantasy film. Weirdly, we both kind of went our separate ways, kind of enjoying the this strange atmosphere, just being in it. I started to hear voices. It sounded almost like children playing, but but not exactly, you know. And and so I started following this this sound. And then as I came to like what felt like with the source of the sound, it sounded like it was actually one with the river. It was like a small stream that down in the in the bottom of the brook. And I knelt down and I, and I, I listened to the stream and listened to these voices coming out of the stream for, I don't know how long, it might have just been a few seconds before. I turned to my friend and, and, and shout, you know, I actually didn't shout him, I think I just sort of, whispered him over sort of thing come and listen to this and he knelt down with me and after we were listening just for a little while and I, I think simultaneously we both looked up and across the bank of the river was um, a group of lights um, like orbs probably about this big and they were moving around and they were alive but this was the feeling that we had. They were alive and they, and we knew that they could see us, you know, that was, and more than that, it felt like they were, they'd come to, 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 sh to this is the way we both interpreted. They'd come to um, show themselves almost, you know, like they wanted to say hello. That's the way we felt. They were interacting sometimes and coming away and they, were, they sort of moved within a, a, an area about this big. And they would come together and move apart. And that we felt like we were being watched or shown. That was the feeling. It was the yeah. build-up too because of the listening to the voices come from the river. That phenomenon I've noticed before, since a few times yeah. too. You know, I've, 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 got, I've been at rivers or heard it and heard, heard the voices. And I've, I've, I've sensed them as well at other times. Not in just in that forest, in other places where it's like, I feel like it's about to start happening again, you know, but it mm -hmm. doesn't go all the way. And then I don't know what happened. We we stared at them for, I don't know how long. That's a bit of a sort of a weird, <laughs> weird time that actually we, we were just staring at these things. We were transfixed. That's, that's like, you know, in awe. We were completely in awe.
and um, and silent and but there was definitely a feeling of of psychic communication or something like that of oneness with these things and it, it kind of went with that shift in the feeling of reality itself being like a dream and then i got spooked because i remembered the um, the folk tales about that area and i remembered the people in these folk tales getting abducted i said like, we've got to get out you know we've got to leave here I've suddenly this sort of really magical i got scared looking back i didn't really feel like um i should have done but i did at the time the strange thing is to get away from this area we actually had to cross the river which meant kind of going towards where this phenomenon where these lights were which if i was scared of i would have really wouldn't have done you know i was acting kind of strange i think i think we both were so we crossed the river and then we went up the bank and out into the light again and we sat down at the top of the other hill on the other side of the valley in in stunned silence I think we we're exchanging a few words here and there, you know, just, and then this, this sort of coda to this little story is this feather, a perfect little white feather floated down right across our eye line like this, like something out of a Disney movie. And before landing absolutely perfectly on my friend's knee and the way it caught our attention and, and it happened so perfectly in the way it sat there, it was just as magical as this thing we'd just seen down at the bottom of the hill, you know, and it was, we felt like so um, lucky. That was the feeling, like so blessed that gratitude was was the overwhelming feeling that we both felt. There was a bit of scepticism, you know, for me. I, I did go over it and I was thinking, how would you fake that effect? Like I, I kind of imagined, I did get to the point where I was thinking, if you were very clever and you had the technology and you were mischievous, you might want to fool some. You, I, we weren't that young. We were about 18, you know. So you might want to fool some people into thinking that there's fairies down there. But you, you couldn't have done everything. No way. I mean, and um, we went and told our friends. And then the next day, we all went back to the same spot and they brought cameras and things like that, you know, hoping to get some photos. But when we got there, the atmosphere was just completely, I mean, it wasn't, you know, I don't want to use the word mundane, but it was normal. You know, it was just totally normal. And, and as soon as we got there, me and my friend who'd witnessed it said to these other people, he said, there's no chance they're not here. You know, if they're not here, we can tell, you know. So that was, that's the story. I mean, there's so many factors to this, isn't there? The Jenny Randall's Oz factor of suddenly something shifting. You're not in what we yeah. refer to as normal reality. This sounds a bit weird, but it felt like reality felt like a fake, like a stage yeah. set. Yeah. Like everything felt unreal in in like a, and very much like being in a dream, you know. Like, mm-hmm. but there was something about it that was like, and when we saw and heard because of the sonic factor, it really was like um, someone pulling back at the curtain you know you're getting to see behind the curtain of reality and and also what it what it made what it looked like as well or felt like was that reality is a bit of a bad stage set you know you can see through it that's kind of how we felt that night as well it was an easy trick almost that we were always falling for but we were somehow lucky enough to see behind it or something yeah. that night that our kind of waking normal reality is the illusion and that actually yeah, maybe, you get yeah. to see <laughs> you get to see what's really real in these experiences. I think what's interesting also, or well, first of all, you've gone off the beaten track, haven't you? You're yeah. exploring and you're being led by perhaps your own curiosity or other forces. We don't know what led you there. But once you've entered into this space, you you talked about becoming sort of quite childlike and mm. and and sort of going into this yeah. childlike state of wonder where you're really sensing and we can remember doing that as kids can't we if we even if we just went into the garden or we're at the park or wherever we were there was sensory experiences that we just don't seem to or we very rarely anyway 
well, at least not sort of naturally tap into as adults, but as kids, yeah. it's innate, isn't it? Something you said then really chimes with me is, is that, um, you know, like going off the beaten track and we were kind of breaking rules, you know, like, so just going down this way and into the forest without the paths and everything, uh, as, as stupid as that might sound, but we were. And another thing about the phenomenon that I've noticed in other experiences is that it that it loves you to play along. So I, th- I feel like our attitude of who we were, you know, and that was our playground. We'd, we'd spent a lot of time growing up there, spent having fires, camping out. But we knew it like the back of our hands, you know. And my granddad walked in that part of the wood all the time. That was his favourite part of the wood, you know. So, uh, And that was where we would get up to, you know, loads of naughtiness. Not in that particular spot where they were, because mm. that was in a sort of, quite a strange little nook and cranny down by a little river but just up just up a little bit on the ledge we would spend god you know so much of my time like um playing making fires there's something about that naughtiness that i think is like the resonant maybe you know so we spent ages inhabiting it and i, th- I suppose the way i feel now is that it, it was almost like um like we us and this thing were, were the same in some way. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. we'd been playing along for maybe years before this thing had happened, you know. That's a very important, I feel, that you were familiar with this environment because this is something that comes up again and again where there's this kind of relationship. And, and what I tend to notice a lot is that there's this kind of communing between us as individuals and the landscape particularly when and it can really build when you get to know a landscape you are just very very familiar with it do you remember what time of year and the time of day that it it was dusk in the bottom of the the uh the the valley it was dark but then as you went up as the trees got thin at the tree line you were in quite quite it was quite daytime so I'm, I'm I think it must have been sort of early or late summer yeah I didn't write a diary I've yeah. only written a few notes in my life for, with dates next to them so I I can't remember do you remember what color the orbs were were they so, kind yeah. of I think they were mostly white but but I'm tempted to say they had like you know oranges and purples or something like that, like mm. strands, you know, quite will, will o the wisp type things. I only found out about that phenomenon a long time later, like just just a few years ago, actually. And 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 then I was just sort of like, oh yeah, that's definitely what it was. And then I was I looked, looked into it a bit more, and I thought, no, these were more alive than the will o the wisp sounds and, and the singing and stuff of the sound. So these were more living orbs of plasma or something like that exactly yeah Yeah. that's that's the right word to describe them really this kind of living plasma this kind of energy or consciousness of some kind i know like people like yourself have have, have seen like lots of humanoid things right yeah yeah that is not not uncommon in this area too and i I, and uh, i've got friends who've seen little people you know of different sorts and things like that so I've never experienced anything like that um can you describe anything about the voices like I said they were like kind of like children but not exactly they were and and there was no um discernible words or anything like that definitely a a real cheekiness and like they were playing when when I think about now it's obvious that they were kind of (laughs) reeling me in you know, that's how I felt. Like I was, I was, I was just following this. Uh, I was being fairy led. You know? Yeah, being pixie led. Yeah. And then the, and then the, the brilliant twist was when I got to the river, and they were coming from the river. I mean, I've, and I know what a river sounds like. We all do, you know. It's like I know what a little babbling brook sounds like. But this was, it was mingled really beautifully with the river. So it was like the river was was singing and talking and playing. Sure. See, so so it, 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 we get to like the these maybe like elementals or whatever you want to call them you know do you remember if anything happened kind of around that time in your life afterwards no I can't remember but there was so much stuff happening you know Mm -hmm. just socially um 
and everything like that. Like it was a time of a lot of change because maybe it was just before uh, we all kind of split to go to, to university and stuff. There was a whole load of different things happening, but but because I was with somebody, I mean, it changes. This is why it's a story, you know, because I've got lots of other stories that just happened to me alone, you know, but I felt like yeah. perhaps this was going to go dark, you know, and I think maybe as, as well, there was a feeling of even if it's not out to get you, mm-hmm. us, it was maybe still dangerous, you know, that, that this could could have it could like getting too close to a fire or something like that it could we could get burnt because i'd heard some versions of the fairy stories of that area but it's basically someone gets taken to fairyland at one point and there is like kind of bad some evil fairies and maybe some good i can't remember the story so i only had little crumbs from my childhood really but because i knew there was some malefic kind of element to it I think that was, I, I remembered that and thought, well, we have to get out of here. I, I think I was just being cautious of us and uh, in general. I think if it was up to my friend, he probably would have stayed there. And I, I might have just gone all the way. I don't know. I might have just gone to, to Fairyland or something. I don't know. That's also sort of part of that, the Oz factor in, in that you've entered into this reality, not reality different sounds you know different senses going on what what often happens when people kind of come out of that with any kind of contact is quite blurry it's quite fuzzy we weren't behaving usual it was as if we would we we would walked into a, a field of 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 <laughs> gas or something that was like making us behave you know like like children or something yeah. like that you know like you could literally feel you say that there was something like but as quickly as we went into it it, it disappeared you know mm. so mm. it wasn't like a drug effect of any sort that i've experienced before you know it was a no. and yeah i've heard that before about in a, a lot of alien abduction account encounters where people they should be frightened out of the wits at what's happening but they're not no. And uh, that's been my experience with other ex- experiences too. You know, you just think there's something, it's like you know it, you know it or something. Yes. There's an other part of you that knows what this thing is and how to interact with it. This thing that happened, it was because there were two of us that saw it, it was kind of closer to this world. It was, it was as if the astral was really solid. It, it, sure. My um, <laughs> metaphysical uh, uh, metaphors or whatever there that's kind of how it felt if it was to happen when you're completely alone something like that then the subjectivity hallucination things can can really but when things are more solid especially with there's a few people who see them and there's a lot of encounters where people describe slightly different things isn't there yeah, you'll this... know about that you know yeah. there might be a group of people who see something and, and a group that don't but what I think I was driving at is that this was very much manifest in this world, even though it did feel like the world had gone fake, you know, like I said, like a dream. And that feeling of the, of the world being a dream is often felt in times of traumatic experiences, like mm-hmm. a car crash, for example, or something like that, where yeah. suddenly everything is like unreal and, mm-hmm. and the brain's trying to catch up. And that I think that mm-hmm. feeling... Um, is very close to the to the to this to the, that Oz effect feeling. Yeah. It's like a, something going on there. It can be good experiences too. Like you know, it can be real uh, magical things. But it's it's. I think there needs to be something that that really shifts and jolts you out of the the thing or something like that. But and experience it in 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 the everyday is what I'm saying. That feeling that that, that was there that night when you have different experiences sometimes you can shift and it can be through some kind of shock or even joy or perhaps the the landscape that you're walking into maybe there was something about the landscape there but what happens is you start to experience the world through a different perceptual filter so you have your kind of home filter that you're usually experiencing you know the world through if you're jumping into these other realms of experience especially if you're used to experiencing say through your third eye if you or your connection to the all if you have say opened your mind already and exercised that muscle through 
the natural medicines that you'd been experimenting with, you're kind of used to that. Your being is used to flitting into these different states. And so when you step into what you stepped into that that day, it wasn't so much of a jump for you to open to that, perhaps, as perhaps yeah, somebody else I might would, have been. I would see, I would see that for sure. Yeah, mm. I think, um, it's like you were talking about the uh, natural medicine thing again. Uh, the the becomes the more you will sort of get to know it. The, sometimes the less you have you, you need to use to get to to, certain, to have certain uh, things into and, and and then sometimes it can be like you really don't need the thing anymore get to a point where you can leave that behind you've broken down the the, the filters that were stopping you mm. being able to exercise you to to see the thing I, I, I mean I could go into detail about the years leading up to to that event and mm. the, that forest I had like loads of out of body experiences from being dead very young. This section is available for all members of the Curious Crew who support me on Patreon. Join us there for this and more bonus content. Patreon.com forward slash the Modern Fairy Sightings podcast. When you were down at the riverside, was it more of a stream or a river? I always call it a stream, a babbling brook, you know. Did you feel a sense to step into the no. river in any way no I didn't I didn't want to get in I mean it was no. it's, I, would, I would have only got wet up to my um thighs though <laughs> it's deeper than I was imagining the stream right yeah but okay yeah that's interesting because as you say you then heard the the voices coming from the stream and did your friend get to hear it too you know what he's he, well he's a, he's a he's a bit more stoic than me and and well I would maybe stoic's not the right word but silent he talked very little about it afterwards for a long time and I, and I would talk and I'd describe it and he would just agree that's what happened I never kind of could get it out of him for him from his point of view which is quite telling and he was having other mystical experiences or you know on the lead up to this so it was part of just other things that were happening in our lives you know yeah so I think he just treated it like this is this is just what happens when you start dabbling with this stuff. So I, I didn't actually find out whether he heard them or not. I feel like he did because it was just it seemed blatantly obvious that mm. <laughs> to me the feather had landed on his knee as well I later, think, which yeah. is something. Yeah, I did feel like, and I was the I was the scared one who got out of there. So I did feel like you know maybe it was um, more surrounding him that experience. Yeah, although although you know you can read it any any way, but. Did you keep the feather? No, I mean, I don't know where that is. No, I have no idea. Yeah, that's an interesting like, question. <laughs> yeah. and, but since they have popped up at, at very synchronous, synchronistic times, you know, and, and yeah, they've become a little motif. I sort of sometimes keep them. And I, I actually took to visiting that spot, you know, around Christmas time, as a, just, as, just oh, yeah. to say sort of thank you. You know, I've yeah. done that for the past couple of years now. I mean, this happened when we were like 17 or 18, so and I'm 42 now so it's been it's been some time I think in my life as well like I had a, a series of these things happen and I would definitely say they were like karmic there's things that happened that broke down my conditioning and and led to these experiences happening and at the time they were awful I wouldn't have wished them on anything and they were, and they were prolonged and stuff but then afterwards you sort of realize years later how how important and formative these experiences were you know and that without them I just you just wouldn't know certain things you know I wouldn't so it's very difficult to um you know you can start saying you know there's things happen for a reason you know like but there is there is a lot of Bad, bad things do happen you know I'm not saying it's all good for the ultimate good or something like that it might be I don't know but there's definitely um, that's something I've experienced in my life is that terror has has like a transformative effect and it can kind of be like actually something that's useful you know in the long run the things that happen to me I wouldn't want them to happen <laughs> to other people you mm. know but then I'm like grateful for them now so I got, I was really obsessed with Ouija boards in primary school as well. It kind of like goes back to this thing about 
uh, yes, spirits moving things. I'm quite obsessed. With, I was quite obsessed with that idea, you know, as, as a child. You know, I mean, I probably did develop something of, of, of a, like a a magical, you know, safeguard. It wasn't until a lot later that I learned about all this stuff, and that it was. I think it was. I needed to kind of walk into the to the lion's den, you know, in a way. It was like to learn, and then and then kind of then think oh yeah god magical hygiene is, is like a big part of this whole thing you know mm. um, and and like we used to mess around with Ouija boards like nobody's business you know so um and we have lots of results that were sometimes um f- fun and sometimes like really scary you know there's one that we did that was that was the last one we ever did you know and yeah. recently my mind's been going back to them again it's just as an object I think they're beautiful you know and what we when it used to really work that feeling as well again we we're getting getting back to that that feeling of um because i think what what would elicit the 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 effect of a ouija board was often people's nervous tension in the room you know that would usually be the the psychic stuff that gets it going and then after that it, it, even someone cheating, actually, you know, someone actually pushing it, they might actually prime the pump for the people, you know, right. and then suddenly the, the thing is actually working, and right. and right. and that they're like they're that they're the trickster who might be pushing mm-hmm. it is actually kind of like playing along channeling. with spirits, yeah, yeah, like, yeah they're, they're channeling the I trickster. Know, <laughs> yeah, I noticed that those things like that happening, and then me and uh, the same guy actually. <laughs> we did a Ouija board which which had a again as we sat down we were like let, let's do a, a one just me and you to like see what effects we can get you know like see how powerful this thing is how real it is mm-hmm. and it was this is the last one we ever did you see I don't know how old we were at this point but it was really strong and and it was giving us lots of information lots of answers and uh, one thing we noticed as well in that that in ca- time is that the planchette thing we're just using a piece of paper that is that it would use either his hand or my hand but not together and it would hurt after a while this like electric feeling and we would ask it can you use his hand now and it and then he'd start pulling it and then we (laughs) so that was a kind of really strange um, parapsychological effect but it it managed to predict some very particular things you know, which we could then verify straight afterwards. And then it told a kind of joke, which um, was like a sick joke, you know. Um, and and at that point, we were like, oh, my God, this is like a, evil. You know, we thought yeah. it was evil. Yeah. And um, for sure, I, f- I feel like there was um, a whole host of things that happened around that time. And I don't think it was purely down to that that Ouija board thing, but there was a whole host of things that happened to my friends, which were like high strangeness events, more like poltergeisty events. Mm-hmm. Um, I have another friend in our friendship group at that time, he, he would get attacked and people would see it. Like you'd see him get attacked. He drew blood sometimes. I was, And at one time I wasn't there, but he got, he got hit in the face uh, in the basement of someone's house. And both of them turned and they both saw someone running out from yeah, running away yeah so oh, that's and awful. I've, it's really i have horrendous. another story about him there was a lot of activity <laughs> that went on around this other friend of mine around that time which would which is like more like haunting but i'm not sure i always think about this and it's like i'm not sure if it's like um part of oneself becomes you know and it's energetically detached and it's kind of it haunting yourself you know like it could be kind of how, how it seemed almost you know the way I view it now is a lot different like the Ouija board is it gets its power from people being scared of it and and that is how it works and so and if you want like to have else. <laughs> yeah if yeah right yeah. <laughs> I think and if you want to like um kind of engage the phenomena as it were in any way like a Ouija board Ouija board might not be the best way for you. It might be whatever gets your mm. jeebies going, you know. And and uh, and that for me became, you know, 
going out into the woods at night because a lot of people would think that's really frightening just the thought of that and I, I, I said well I do it every every night you know we would sit there doing or I'd do it alone I would do it with friends and we were mm. kind of trying to elicit that feeling of of kind of fear really I mean it's magical wonder but it comes with, with a lot of the fear is kind of really does get the thing moving yeah. no I, yeah. I agree vague feelings of of, of of like reasons for it all happening and yeah uh, you feel it's kind of like working towards something that is of meaning for you in this lifetime here yeah i mean i'd rather I'd, i wouldn't want to say i'm going you know, there's going to be an end well i suppose there is no. death and all that, but it's kind of like a yeah i don't know it's just to be just to learn and and, and be good you know because i haven't been a good person for the for, like so it's all the humbling sort of things you know that uh, that if there's anything then it's it's the hope that you're going to learn and grow and, and um yeah yeah get wiser and more patient wiser. more loving you know and all that kind of thing more understanding mm. more, more more resilient and things like that just basic things that normal people want to talk about you know well, it's it's true I mean sort of working with with children they teach you a lot of that in fact don't they that resilience that innate wisdom just to just try to not be. to to knock it out of them you know to like you talk about mm. fostering the letting the plant grow giving it and yeah. what it needs but not interfering and all that yeah. kind of thing yeah. I don't have children so I'm not uh, but I do work with a lot of children. I see, you know, uh, you know, I try and keep myself a child or something like that. You know? Yeah, no, it's it's good to know that uh, I do have some friends that are teachers or you know work with children in some way, and I'm so glad that they are out there doing what they're doing and keeping the magic alive in children's lives. I did get really into light language. I got into it through through improvised music really so right. I came at it quite intellectually late, later on but I'd had mm-hmm. experiences of this it's just glossolalic speaking in tongues mm-hmm. that can come through and, and people get really good at it and they become channels for for this language which mm-hmm. they, they say is coming from all different places you know people have different rationales for for how it works mm-hmm. and there's quite interesting studies on it you know people have done studies on glossolalia but I got into it because I was interested in improvised music because I was kind of like it, we were improvising a lot doing our music yeah. and and I'd be like well this is ch- coming from somewhere and 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 it's not it's not language in the n- normal sense but it's and then I realized that it was very much like what, what the light language channels are doing and I have and then I developed a project a musical project around using light language ch- channeling so I would go on the internet and find people who do collect hundreds of hours of people who would upload videos of themselves, light language channeling, and um, then I'd mix it all together into like a long patch, patchwork piece, which was like a ceremony or something like that, you know. Yeah. So these were individuals working at home alone, just doing it on in the laptops, yeah. channeling some good energies or whatever they were doing. And then I would piece it together. So I've kind of become a a bit of a, a light language fan and enthusiast of the whole scene. There's a big online scene of people who do it. Oh, um, I'd, I'd love to hear that. You sent me your music that you had made with a water harp. I absolutely loved it when I first oh, heard that. Right. And as I say, I, I ended up using some in the um, Jack Frost episode with your kind permission. Yeah. So yeah, how did that come about? Because of course, it links in with you being drawn to the water. Oh you know? sure, yeah, well, that's... I can't remember how it happened really, but I've been I've been playing with wind harps, Aeolian harps for quite some time, you know. Um, quite common things, aren't they? And then I, I w- I'd been building instruments for a long time too. And then it struck me one day, and because I was out, I was actually in Cornwall with a with my Aeolian harp, and I was wondering, does it work in the water? And I first thing I took it in the sea, actually. And 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 I, wrote, I noticed that when I dragged it along, and you have to use a special microphone, you can't just hear yeah, it. Not. Yeah. Um, and when I dragged it along in the water, they started to make make sing quite nicely. And then I realized, you know, oh God, a river's just perfect, isn't it? You know, it's moving water. So 
I think the next day I took it to a river in Ethy Woods in Cornwall and I stuck it in the river and it sang. And this is a this is where we get back to the fairies, I think. Is it, it, it sounded like a human voice. Well, it sounded like a voice, not a human voice, like an angelic voices sometimes, you know, depending on how you tuned it, the flow of the river, the depth you put it, there's lots of factors. And it's kind of it's it's a, like a living thing because the river has got a lot of chaos, so it doesn't do the same thing. It's like kind of like the wind, but a bit more reliable. In that the, the wind is far more precocious, isn't it? You know, when it comes and goes, the river it still has a, a lot of chaos. So the, the the river harp would sing, but it would definitely have this feeling of being alive that like you couldn't predict it, sort of thing. And it was very those. And it has been forever, I should say, actually sitting with the river harp with your, with my headphones recording it is like a, a super magical experience for me, just listening to the river sing. And I feel like uh, in my uh, imagination, perhaps, that it, it really enjoys being given a voice, you know, mm. it's like it enjoys this sort of uh, interaction. And um, so me and my friend, we 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 love making instruments and interacting in the, with nature in all different ways so we made an album it's not just the river harp it has all kinds of stuff rain dripping rocks um wind and other things and we built instruments that we could then put in the environment record and we saw it as like um dowsing or something like that or channeling yeah as well. you know we we were making radio antennas for for spirits to speak you know that was it that was the way we framed it sort of thing and then with very little editing we would you know overlay them so we'd have like the river harp with the drip drums like you make some, you find a dripping rock in the woods and you'd make little drums for it and you make little beats you know so things like that and we'd overlay them and that's what the album became um it's called environmental meditation music yeah. and i mean we've got we we spent maybe five six years making that one when we I mean we've got so much more material and we we plan on making a series of, mm. and making a video out of it because we didn't actually record any video of these things they actually some of them are quite good they look sculpturally very interesting in the environment too you could make installations that way part of it just to get into the more parascience mm. feeling is um it seems to respond like a, a like an e what they call them biofeedback is what it's, it's, it's like it's responding there's a the definite feeling of that like if you sit with it listening to it you'll notice that undulations in your emotions and undulations in in the the weather and, and the environments and the voice of the instrument are, are very concordant and they'll and they'll, it's like there's some sort of beautiful um in the moment feeling that that is but in both in you and in the environment around you and it's like it's both moving together in the now, you know, you're surfing mm -hmm. the now together. Yeah, and, like um, magic. I, I spoke, yeah, yeah, and, and I, I think, um, you know, weather magic is like mm -hmm. the, it's one of the first kind of, it's one of the primary forms of magic, isn't it? You know, it's like, because, and it gets back to that thing about chaos, I think you've got a lot of a chaotic system. So it's easy, it's more malleable it wants to play along it's more it's sort of, again it wants to play along it's easier to affect in a way or like to get involved with psychically if it's more chaotic the more chaotic the system the more kind of uh it, it, it can be a house for spirits or something like that maybe sound being so malleable and so etheric that I was i was drawn to it as my medium straight away yeah so i was always making music and especially by that time, I mean, I was 18 at that time. I've been, been involved in a lot of different things and quite a, overtly magical music as well, making mystical sounding things, you know. Now some of it's a bit sort of um, twee or childlike or something like that. I might look at it, but I, I've actually gone into doing a lot of stuff, music with children and things like that, you know, right. as I've got older. So, you know, it, it all led in a certain direction, like a oh, career yeah. path or something, you know. What I'm hearing here is you have had so many experiences communing with, you know, go, going out of body and these otherworldly beings in in other worlds, you know, going to other places than um, this kind of waking material 
uh, plane. Uh, but when you're talking about making this music, um, it sounds to me as if it's really grounding for you too. There's something about that. So you are still communing and you are still open, but it's a really kind of grounded way. In fact. I would, I would, I would definitely. I'm, I'm not put, I'm not pushed back, but I would say, you know, that it took me like quite a long time to integrate this, but th th there isn't a difference between this world and the other worlds. You know, mm -hmm. it's just it is all one thing, and and that life is kind of a dream. The best metaphor for life is is dream. I think mm -hmm. that's what. I've, so, but getting back to being grounded, because you have to feel like you're somewhere. <laughs> Yeah. You know, you have to feel like even if that is temporary and, and maybe ultimately an illusion, you know, those experiences like, you know, I got really into cold water swimming but over the past like five or six years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that was for the same reason that I wanted to hurt myself in those early days, because mm -hmm. it puts me in the bottom in my body, you know, yeah. so and it does it in a really healthy way. So and I was into skateboarding for years for the same mm -hmm. reason, too, because it's like a way of of being dangerous that was kind of socially endorsed you know that I enjoyed a lot as well you know but it was a way of putting myself in the physical really in the physical physical is kind of an illusion too and um, that's quite quite frightening I think I, uh, that goes back to talking about derealization and mental feeling mentally ill you know it's like what you really want is to feel grounded and so, and if everything feels like it's a dream that's, that can be really quite scary that's you know hard especially when you're going through you know growing up and going through those you know tender years it's very difficult because you do need to sort of feel like you've got a base from which to explore you know a safe a somewhere yeah. safe to come back to so that you can kind of go out there and test something else and then come back and test here and come back so that that's really tough actually to yeah. to sort of have all of that going on at that time but the, the the um going back to the instruments and things mm. it definitely grounds me but more of that more of what the feeling that i'd say is it connects me you know to the yeah. earth yeah, and, the, and the and the and the, the physical forces you know you feel like a, and it animates them for me you know because i'm a i suppose i'm a total animist in my worldview that it is it's all alive you know mm. and this is just a way of making that more explicit or something like that you know and playing with it a little using a few tricks well yeah well, thank you very much for sharing all You're of this right. with me are you still friends with the guy that you went down to the river with strange um he's, he lives abroad and um i will see him again i was gonna say just the record we didn't mm. we, we, we agreed on that yeah. And other mystical experiences that we'd had together, you know, we we were together on that. There was one time we saw, saw each other as if through a fog in a dream, like we were both sleeping. And I, I woke up. I was like, "Oh my god, I've just seen him!" And then he and then he, he came running around to my house, and he just was like, "I saw you," you know. And we just and we yeah. just seen each other in a dream. It was a very strange experience, a very quick one. I think that was a, a few years before the orb experience that one and i'd seen i'd seen this guy do do some strange things too you know like um open his mouth and emit strange sounds while whilst in trance and all kinds of things like that you know i've seen i'd saw some things that were inexplicable <laughs> mm, sounds like two young men sort of very open and it's great that you had each other to do all this exploration yeah as well, like, because... like I said, it wasn't just two of us it was a group and we were very lucky to have each other but then it comes back to that soul family thing as well you feel like mm. that's just too too good to be true you know that you would have that that would but but who knows you know it's all who kinds of knows how it all gets put together <laughs> yeah.